Welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service 2014 Science Seminar Series. The goal of this seminar is to communicate and discuss a variety of marine topics of interest to NOAA, the coastal and marine community, and anyone else who is interested. If you or your partners would like to present your work here, or you have a topic you would like to suggest or open for discussion, please contact me, Tracy Gill. If you are not receiving the NOAA Weekly Seminar list and you'd like it, please contact Hernan Garcia or me, or just Google NOAA Seminar to find out more. The presenter would prefer to take questions after the talk unless you have a clarifying question. And if you are interested in getting a PDF copy of today's presentation, it will be made available through either Jana or myself. You can email us. <clears throat> so today's topic of, of the seminar is a really important one to NOAA and, and one that we have a hard time addressing. The title is called Science Talk, Why Being a Scientist Isn't Enough. And our speaker, our speaker is Jana Goldman from Press Here. A little bit about Jana. She has been a daily newspaper reporter and editor, a deputy press secretary for a U.S. senator, and the communications director for two Washington area nonprofit organizations. In March 2013, she retired from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, <laughs> where she was the public affairs officer for NOAA's research office for 14 years. She launched her company, Press Here, in May, specializing in science-related press events, plain language, and media training. Jana lives here in Silver Spring, Maryland with her husband, anthropologist and author, Michael French Smith, and their mixed Airedale Zoe. Please welcome Jana Goldman. Thank you. Thank you all. And I'm just so delighted to be here. There's so many people here in person, um, some familiar. So I, when I ran into Tracy um, was in the fall, we were over at Caribou Coffee. She invited me to speak uh, at, the, at the series. And I said, well, what should I talk about? And she said, well, just tell people what you've, what you've been doing. And so, uh, as she said, um, uh, I've retired in March. Uh, some of you uh, in Building 3 have noticed that it's a lot quieter there. So that's because I'm not there making noise. Um, where I was the public affairs officer for NOAA Research. Um, Monica Allen now holds that position, and I hope she's enjoying it as much as I did. Um, so what exactly have I been doing? You know, while the term is retirement, it really isn't all just kickback, bonbon eating, uh, lady of leisure. I've been really busy, uh, but fun busy, and it's busy on my own terms, which is one of the great joys of, of uh, not having a, a full-time job. Um, but one of the things I do is I volunteer at the Wheaton Riding Stable one day a week where I muck out stables and I'm learning horsemanship literally from the ground up. I also joined the board for the Center for Plain Language. Uh, many of you know I'm an advocate for clear communication and uh, plain writing and plain communication. And as Tracy said, I started my own little science communication uh, company uh, called Press Here, which so far, like the Center for Plain Language is a nonprofit, but we're working on that. Um, so being on my own schedule also allows me time to do a lot of things, like participate in events, like uh, uh, I was at uh, the American Geophysical Union meeting uh, in, um, in December in San Francisco. I presented a poster with one of my colleagues at the National Science Foundation about working with scientists uh, and reporters in the Arctic. Um, and I've been to a couple other science communications uh, conferences given by the National Academies. Um, there's a lot of interest from a lot of the science organizations about science communication, helping scientists communicate their work better. Um, and those are the two things I love to do, working with reporters, working with scientists, and um, a lot of the things I learned that the workshops I'm going to share with you today, some of it's very familiar to those of you who are in communications, but it's probably worth hearing again. So as, the, uh, as my slide suggests, the title, uh, being a scientist just isn't enough. You also need to share your science and learn how to share your science. Um, you should tell people what you do, why you do it, and why you sh they should care. As I said, I'm encouraged that the science organizations are taking this seriously and offering a lot of science communication workshops for both communication practitioners such as myself and scientists such as many of you in, in, in this room and on the phone. Um, I'm also delighted when I hear of instances of scientists uh, initiating uh, 
opportunities to improve their communication skills. And one I just heard of a couple days ago was it's called the Hot Air Society, and it's a group of scientists from NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, GFDL, up in Princeton. And they started a, a little Toastmasters group uh, to learn uh, uh, communication skills. So one of the young women who uh, started this sent me one of her videos of her giving a presentation. And I was delighted uh, that she did because she gave some great examples in her talk. And one was she was at a meeting and people were talking about computer racks. And somebody said, well, what exactly is a rack? The person very clearly explained that it was like a refrigerator, OK, the size of a refrigerator. That's something that people can understand. Another instance she gave was uh, people starting to talk, to talk in acronyms. And somebody had mentioned um, OBE. Well, she has a British background. So OBE for her was Order of the British Empire instead of um, over, overtaken by events, right, overtaken by events. Um, or that could be out of body experience, too. So again, these are nice little lessons to, to take with you that you know, to know the language of people to whom you're speaking. So the numbers vary, but for the most part, people generally trust scientists. One figure given at the AGU meeting, um, was uh, uh, a study found that 93% of uh, Americans believe that scientists contribute to society's well-being. However, that same speaker noticed that just 3% of scientists say they talk to reporters, and only 1.7% of news is about science. Um, that shouldn't be surprising, because a few months earlier at the National Academy, someone had reported that um, U.S. business spends about $1 trillion with a, tree, uh, with a, a T, $1 trillion on communication, but only $1 billion with a B on science communication. So three zeros might not look like a lot, but it makes a huge difference about the amount of money spent on science communication. Another study shows that uh, about 15% of Amer the American people say they know a scientist, which is not very much. But they may know you as a neighbor. They may know you as Muffy's mom. So that could be either your, your dog's name or your kid's name. They might know you as the uh, little league coach. But they don't know you as a scientist. And scientists, too, tend to look at the big picture, which is the telescope. But the general public wants local information. They want to know, what are you doing? How, what are you doing that is going to affect me? How is that affecting where I live, what I do? Um, my everyday life. People also want to know who you are, why you do what you do, and they want to hear it from you. When I was a public affairs officer, reporters didn't want to talk to me. They wanted to talk to you, people who are doing the work, because you have that passion. You know the importance of your work. You can explain your story better than, than I possibly could. But a lot of people don't know how to do this. They say, I don't know how to talk to reporters. I don't know how to talk to somebody else. Um, or some people just say, I don't want to do it. I'm paid to be a scientist. I'm going to do my science, nothing else. But should you decide you want to do this, there's some help. You might say, how do you do it? So how do you tell your story? Let people know why they should care about what you do. Easiest thing is to try to take three or four of your main points and distill it in a way uh, so they're easiest to understand. Watch out for jargon. And prepare some memorable quotes. I mean, I'm sure those two people illustrated would have some very interesting stories to tell. But it isn't easy. Simplicity isn't easy. One hallmark of intellect is the ability to simplify, to make the complex easy to understand. Anyone could be unclear. And this is from a, a Dallas Morning News editor. Sorry about this. Quote. Yeah, it was a lovely quote. Um, also, to uh, Susan Joy Hassel, who is a great science communicator. I'm sure many of you have heard of, of her. Um, she says, it's not dumbing down what you know, but smartening up what you know. Because we, I ran into this when I was at NOAA. I'd come into contact with some scientists, and we try to simplify. i say, no, you're just dumbing down this, this is the science, and I'm not going to do it. And I said, no, you're giving people an opportunity to, to learn new things. And then, 
Um, I would always get the argument, well, let's, let's let them learn new things. Let's learn, use these big words and these complicated things. Well, if people don't understand it, they're just going to stop dead. And an example I've used in my plain language training a lot, and a lot of you have probably heard it, was when I first came to NOAA, I really didn't know what the word anthropogenic meant, but I learned what it was, and I started using it everywhere, and then found out I was boring, and of course then went to human cause. People understood that. Once you start throwing big polysyllabic words at people, you're going to lose them. But this is not easy to do. So how do you reach your audience once you've decided to uh, talk to them? There have been huge changes in the media. Um, I was, Tracy said I was a daily newspaper reporter and editor way, 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 way back. Um, but it was a completely different. Uh, you're, you don't have your traditional news sources, which usually are vetted in some way. There's been some fact checkers or some editors or people wanting to know you know, the says who, as we call it, you know, who are your sources. Nowadays, most people get their news um, from internet, from blogs, from all these different sources that you're not quite sure what, you know, where they're getting their stuff. So they're not necessarily a credible source. And usually when people don't have fact checkers or they're picking up stuff from the internet, you often uh, get instances <coughs> where people are picking up fake news. I'm sure many of you know The Onion, which is a satirical uh, news site, and how many times has somebody picked that up and it's you know, gone like wildfire because somebody thought it was true? Um, it's very, very difficult. So I, when I was in the newspaper business, I had editors say, you know, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. So always try to find the source of your information here. So what with Colorado now, you know, uh, making marijuana legal, it might be uh, good to say, okay to say this in public, uh, trust your dealer is another uh, way to uh, trust your news. So what's, you know, what's your news source? So there was a story recently, it's Colorado Pop Shop accepting food stamps, taxpayer funded marijuana for welfare recipients. People went nuts over this and in fact there was uh, a Colorado legislator who started uh, some sort of uh, bill to prohibit this from happening, and uh, all these other sites were picking it up until they found out it was fake. It was from a fake news site. And again, this has caused a lot of problems, and you know, know, know your source here. So, one place you can trust, or who are the trusted people? Who you know, who can you trust when you're getting information? Of course, Carl Sagan was. Uh, was one, and he was actually vilified by the scientific community when he started speaking, speaking to the public. And uh, he's well known for cosmos, and even though he's associated with billions and billions, apparently he never said that, but it was such a great quote that it was attributed to, to him. Um, but he said, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. So you as scientists, you as communicators have a real opportunity to um, improve the scientific education. Here's another person who's uh, recently been doing, uh, uh, in fact, he's going to be uh, uh, on the new version of Cosmos. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's an astrophysicist. And he says, we have adults who either don't understand or don't like science saying, we need our kids to learn it. And he says, no, I say, no, how about you? You need to learn it. And I think adults might be the diff most difficult um, audience to crack. Kids are like sponges. You know, they want to learn everything. They want to know everything. Adults are a little, little, a little bit harder. And I used to be a volunteer at the reptile house at the National Zoo and handled snakes and lizards, and I loved it. It was wonderful. I never had any problem with kids wanting to touch snakes or touch lizards or ask questions. Those are the adults who would kind of shrink back. And I'd go up to them afterwards, and I'd say, well, you know, if you'd like to, you know, I see you're a little uneasy. If you'd like, we can go into the resource room. I can bring out a snake or a lizard. You can touch it and get over this fear and fill it in with some other fear. Um, and, a lot, <laughs> and, and a lot of people declined. And I said, why not? 
And I wasn't being pushy. I was just really being curious. You know, why not? You know, why are you afraid of touching this, you know, very neat animal, which is, you know, smaller than you are, is not venomous, is not going to hurt you. Why are you afraid? And nine times out of ten people said, I just don't know. I just can't do it. Um, so, again, it's the adults who I think you're going to have the biggest challenge with. But, of course, the, the adults are the people who are voting. The adults are the people who control budgets. The adults are the people who are the decision makers. So this is an important audience. So um, scientists who will use narratives or stories, and I'd like to find another word for story, because when somebody says, I'm going to tell you a story, you're not, you, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a fairy tale. I'm trying to find a word, and if anybody knows of a word in any other language, I'd appreciate it letting me know. I'm trying to find a nice word for fact-based story or narrative or account that isn't story or narrative. Both of those, to me, are clumsy. So you know, that might be your assignment before the end of the, the, my presentation. If you could think of a better word, let me know. And if not, my email address is at the end of this presentation. Please, please do let me know. Uh, so we'll use story and narrative until we come up with something better. But uh, scientists uh, using narratives or stories are perceived as, as, as warmer because they're talking to their audiences rather than talking at their audiences. They're telling personal stories. They're showing their own personality when they talk to people. Um, and you may have heard people who say they can't handle science, but rarely have you heard somebody say, I can't handle a story. I can't take a story. I couldn't understand that. So why tell stories or narratives? Um, people remember them. It's as simple as that. There was a, a study in 2002 that showed narratives are recalled twice as well and read twice as fast as evidence-based content. So if you tell, if you're putting out a science paper and you're able to put that in some sort of easily to understand story or narrative, people are going to remember that rather than reading your science paper. It's also le often less about the data than the narrative. So what is the story? How science is done is a story in itself. And those are the stories that I loved when I was working at NOAA. How do you do this? What, what equipment are you using? Where are you going? Why are you doing this? Those are very, very uh, integral parts of a, of a really good story. And they're interesting to people. They capture people's imagination. Um, one of the speakers at AGU noted that stories contain that there are stories in science stories, and I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry, um, there are dead ends, there are surprises, there are mistakes, there are characters, there's personalities, there's motives, and choosing the right topic to study. All these elements go into a good story. As you all know, science is also messy. Findings can change with better data. And so another speaker noticed that you're, when you're a scientist, you're really speaking to four audiences. One is data-driven, your peers, that would be the group of uh, August gentlemen sitting there. Um, their constituents, people who need or use your work, perhaps that person with the uh, interesting flying machine on his back. Um, committed skeptics, they're the ones who are trying to find the weaknesses in your work. And constructively uh, done, it can be a good thing and make your work better. Perhaps that, that gentleman there. And then there are the rest of us. These are the people who uh, seek to understand. We're interested in what you're doing. We want to know what, what you're doing. We think what you're doing is going to make our lives better. So we want to understand that. <clears throat> but sometimes things don't work. So don't be the condescending authority. This is something I have to keep reminding my husband, who's an anthropologist about, because he's a little bit of a know-it-all and likes to show it off, as those of you who know Michael know. Um, he's charming and endearing, but every now and then you have to bring him down a few notches. Don't tell people what you think, but what you think and why you think that. And as Carol Knight always says, how you know what you know. And uh, that's very good advice. But don't expect your values to change people's beliefs. I'm sure many of you saw the study a couple of years ago where even when people were presented with facts, they clung to these particular ideas and beliefs. 
very difficult to change people's mind. Don't focus on winning the arguments, and uh, that's something that Michael has to learn better. Um, and use simple, intuitive statements, like if we put heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere, it'll trap heat. That's something that people can understand. Um, Carol Knight uses a great example, and I don't know well, it well enough to, um, to relate it, but uh, it, it, it involves just knowing physics, that if you put something and you knock something off of a, a, a bench, it's going to fall down. It is not magically going to rise up into the air. So some of the basic science uh, people still need to understand better. So it's worth your while, to, it's, it's worth scientists' while to tell stories. Um, it helps people to use the science. It's interesting, it's fun, um, captures people's attention, like you know, you wonder what these people are doing up here. Um, it helps with decision making. And it's fun and interesting, as I said. Uh, most research has something useful and interesting. Um, your job is finding it and communicating it. If you, help, if you need help finding the story, there are a lot of communications professionals in this room and on the phone who can help you. Um, there is a story in there somewhere. You just have to help find it. So everyone in this story, this was uh, one of the mornings at AGU. Uh, everybody is now on wireless there. Uh, but everyone in this photo is doing some interesting research. And therefore, they're potential communicators. They can tell those stories. Um, they, uh, but one of the things you have to do is make yourself available. So do media interviews, do things like this science seminar talk. This is a great, uh, uh, a great opportunity. Um, find other opportunities to get out there and practice. And, and this is not easy to do. Uh, it is still, I think, public speaking is still number one, followed by death as what people are most afraid of. And believe me, I was very shy. I know you'll find that hard to believe. And I had a tough time learning how to speak before people such as you. I still have a lot to learn and I want to improve my uh, speaking, speak, speak, uh, speaking skills, like learning how to say speaking skills. <laughs> but being afraid of talking to you, I'm not. So again, work with your public affairs people or communicators because they can help you refine your message. Um, they can help you learn to speak plainly, and here's a plug for plain language. Uh, Plainlanguage.gov is, if you don't know it, is an excellent, excellent, excellent resource for, for feds. Um, I was a plain language trainer, and then when I left, they told me I couldn't be a trainer anymore, so that's when I went to the Center for Plain Language, um, which also has some excellent resources, and that is uh, Center for Plain Language, all one word, dot org. Both of those places have some wonderful, wonderful things to do. Um, also, to correct errors of fact, I, I must admit I, I relished in the recent Rush Limbaugh Al Roker flap. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who might not know, during Polar Vortex, <laughs> apparently Mr. Limbaugh went on his radio show and said that this was just a made-up term by the right-wing, you know, left-wing liberals and blah, 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 until Al Roker posted a picture of the 1959 American Meteorological Society glossary showing that polar vortex has been a term used uh, for quite a long time. I'm sure it didn't convince all of Mr. Limbaugh's listeners, but at least he was getting the facts out. <coughs> so here there are some challenges. Language use is one. We talked about that. So um, how you talk to the people with whom you want to talk to. The willingness of your audience to hear the message, that's almost uh, re refers back to maybe Mr. Limbaugh's audience. Some people just don't want to hear it, but a lot of people do. There are fewer outlets to get your message, your stories out. Uh, I call them spokes models, but you know, there needs to be people who are trusted sources, like Carl Sagan was or, or Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, telling your stories and, of course, the money available to do this, the resources, and it's not just dollars, it's technology, it's individuals, but you're a resource. You know, every one of you could be an excellent storyteller, and I know some of you are excellent storytellers. So um, science and art uh, belong to the whole world. 
So go do it. There's a lot of help available. And it's been a gas. Thank you very much. I will take some questions, comments, and um, I really appreciate seeing you all. Thank you all for coming out and being on the phone today.